Hi everyone, I'm Jerry Schumann, pastor here at Ludlow Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this video blesses and encourages you in your faith. And please consider sharing this on social media. Doing so is a strategic way that we're able to share the gospel with other people today. But before we begin, please keep this in mind. This video is not intended to be, and really it cannot be, a replacement for your commitment to a local church. God commands his people to gather regularly for worship and for fellowship under the leadership and the care of godly elders where the whole body is knit together and that's how the body grows and builds itself up in love. So nothing online can be a replacement for that. So if you're in the area, uh, come and join us for worship. We'd love to have you with us. If you're not nearby, please be sure that you are committed to a local, faithful, Bible-believing church. Thank you, and God bless. Allow me to welcome all of you to uh, Ludlow Baptist Church's worship service. I hope you got a bulletin. If you didn't, please get one. There are two items that I'd like to highlight. There's going to be a summer VBS meeting May 7th here after the worship service. And Molly has brought a number of Joe, her husband's clothes that are downstairs. If you can enjoy using them, you will be welcome to take them for the next week or so. Anything else that needs to be highlighted? If not, the book of John chapter 1 verse 1 reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, that's Jesus Christ, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that had been made. In him is life, and that life was the light of men. We have the privilege this morning of not only thinking about those truths, but personally believing or not that Jesus is the creator and the light of the world. And for those of us who do believe that, we have the additional privilege of worshiping him in grace and truth. And I pray that as the Holy Spirit is amongst us, because the word says where two or three are gathered together, he's in the midst, that he will guide our worship this morning, that he'll open your eyes and open your ears so that you hear the truth of the word of God. And that he gives you faith to believe that so that it affects you. So that when you walk out of here, you're a different person, a better person. More like the Lord Jesus. So will you bow your heads with me? We thank you for the word of God. The written word, the living word. We thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ came to this world to show us the Father, to pay for our sins, to offer us a life eternal and abundant life. And we pray now that your Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>
Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. The creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can find. He gives strength to the weary. Understanding no one can fathom, he gives strength to the weary. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But all those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, they will Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God? Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God? The creator of the ends of the earth, he will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom, he gives strength to the weary. reading from God's holy word. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the habited, inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats, it is not enough for you to feed on the good pasture, that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture, and to drink of clear water, that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet? And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet, and drink what you have muddied with your feet? Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with side and shoulder, and thrust at all the weak with your horns, till you have scattered them abroad. I will rescue my flock, and they shall no longer be a prey. 
and I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. Next to Hebrews 13, 20 through 25. Now may the Lord, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, indeed, thanks be to God. We thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Father, for the innumerable ways that you care for us and love us. And as we consider today how Jesus is a faithful shepherd and how he cares for us so consistently, so faithfully, so lovingly, so personally, uh, Father, I pray that you would strengthen the weary, the downhearted, the discouraged. Um, help us, Father, to, to take comfort and hope in the fact that our great shepherd, that he cares for his sheep. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, after, I think it's 14 months, going verse by verse through Hebrews today, Lord willing, we are coming to the end of this wonderful book. And uh, the heights, the glorious heights that we've seen over the last 14 months have been uh, again and again that Jesus Christ is superior to every aspect of the Old Covenant. That's been the consistent theme that we've seen in this book. We've seen that the Old Covenant was given through angels, but Christ has received a name that is far more excellent than angels because Jesus is the Son of God. He is one with God in deity. And because Jesus, as God's Son, is seated at God's right hand. We've seen that the mediator of the Old Covenant, it was Moses. But Jesus is counted of worthy of much more glory than Moses because Moses was just a servant in God's house, but Jesus is the builder of God's house. We've seen that the Levitical priests, they served under the Old Covenant, but Jesus is our great high priest, not in the order of Levi, but in the order of Melchizedek. And being in the order of Melchizedek, he receives his priesthood not because of his lineage, but he receives his priesthood because of an indestructible life. Jesus has been risen from the dead. He forever lives to minister on our behalf, and therefore he has an eternal priesthood. He is a mediator of a far greater covenant than the old covenant. It is a covenant, the one that he enacts, is one in which the law of God is not external. It's not written on tablets of stone, but it's written on human hearts, on our hearts, where we have the desire to walk in obedience to God. And it's a covenant in which everyone in the new covenant knows the Lord. We've seen that our priest, Jesus Christ, he has a far greater ministry. Because he does not minister in the earthly temple, which is a shadow of heavenly realities. But because Jesus Christ laid down his life and has risen from the dead, he ascended on high and he is there at the heavenly holy place ministering on our behalf. And we have seen that as our high priest, that he has offered up a far better sacrifice than the Old Testament sacrifices. Not like those sacrifices of bulls and goats that are offered again and again and again, but Christ offered up a once for all sacrifice. And through his complete sacrifice, he has put away sins once and for all. We could go again and again and again and continue on with how Christ is superior. But brothers and sisters, I hope that there's one truth that's emblazoned upon your mind on account of Hebrews. It is this. Jesus is superior. He is superior. And the way that we're called to respond that we see again and again in Hebrews 
is found in these warning passages, uh, these five warning passages, and collectively, they, they summon to us, don't turn away from Christ. Don't fall away from Christ, because if you do, you'll be eternally ruined. But instead, press on confidently in the faith. Hebrews 10, 21 through 23 says this, Since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Amen. Hold fast the confession of our hope. Press on in the faith. Keep looking to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Now, maybe as we've looked at our call to hold fast our confession, maybe you have been very much aware of your own weaknesses, of your own shortcomings, of the ways in which you are so easily unfaithful, of, of how you are so easily swayed from walking in faithfulness to Christ. And what a great enemy we have in Satan. And perhaps you might think to yourself, how can I be faithful to endure to the end? Well, the good news that we see in our passage is that while we are weak and frail like a sheep, that we have a shepherd in Jesus Christ. And he is not just any shepherd, but he is the great shepherd. Look at verse 20. It says, Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. In the Old Testament, it was the leaders of the people of God that they were referred to as the shepherd of Israel. And their responsibility before God was to care for the sheep, to tend to the sheep, to lead the sheep in righteousness, to point the sheep to God, to be mindful and prayerful of the sheep. And what we see again and again in the Old Testament is the leaders of Israel were not faithful. Not only did they not care for the sheep, but they actually fed upon the sheep. They abused the sheep. They did harm to the sheep. And God gives the promise that we just read in Ezekiel 34. God says, I'm going to be the shepherd. I'm going to tend to them. I'm going to be faithful where the leaders of Israel were not faithful. And then we see the promise in Ezekiel 34, 23, where he says, And I will set up my servant David to be shepherd over them. This glorious mystery of the shepherd will be God but he'll also be the son of David. And that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the son of God, who is also the son of David. He is the good shepherd, and he is the one who cares perfectly for us as his sheep. He cares for us in our weakness and our frailty and gives us all we need. So let me ask you this question this morning. Do you know of Jesus' shepherdly care? Do you know it personally? Do you find comfort in his shepherdly care for you? Do you rejoice in the way that he personally loves and provides for you and cares for you and tends to every need that you have? Do you, do you know him as your good shepherd? Well, what we see in our passage at the conclusion of the book of Hebrews is we see four demonstrations of Jesus' shepherdly care for his sheep meant to encourage you in your call to press on in the faith. So let's look at these one at a time. The first encouragement here is this. Through the care of our great shepherd, the God of peace equips you to do his will. Verses 20 through 21, this is a benediction in prayer form. And he refers to God with perhaps the most wonderful title in all of scripture. And it's this, the God of peace. Think of that. Our God, through Christ Jesus, is the God of peace. And this is a title that's used at least seven other times in the New Testament. The God of peace. And this title, it's consistently used not for all people, but it's used in, for us as believers. God is not the God of peace for those who are outside of Christ. He is the God of peace for us who by faith have turned to Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, this is marvelous news because in our sin, before we came to know Christ, that we were at enmity with God. Sin not only corrupts our nature, it also corrupts our relationship with God. When Adam and Eve sinned in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, what happened to them? 
They were driven out of the Garden of Eden, away from the presence of God. Because God is a holy God, sin necessarily separates us from God. It, it divides us from God. It breaks that relationship that we had with God. Ephesians 4.18 says that before we came to know Christ, that we were alienated from the life of God. We, we were estranged from God, from the blessings of God, from the favor of God, from the life that's in God. We, we didn't know that it all is far off from us. And in our sin, we were enemies of God. Romans 8, 7 says, For the mind that's set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. And before we came to know Christ, did we have our mind set on anything else but the flesh? The answer is no. The mind set on the flesh is hostile to God. If someone outside of Christ says they do not know God, you can look at their life and you can see, uh, or pardon me, if someone outside of Christ says that they do not hate God, said, no, I don't, I don't hate God at all. I just don't trust in him. The way you can tell of their attitude towards God is by the conduct of their life. And Romans 8, 7 says, the mind that's set on the flesh is hostile to God for it does not submit to God's law. Those outside of Christ they are not willing to live under the authority of God. They're not willing to yield themselves to the commands of God. They don't have a desire to walk in obedience to God. And so there's enmity that they have towards God. But our hostility is not only us towards God. It's also a holy hostility that God had towards us. God has a holy hatred of sin. And God's word says in Romans 1.18, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. John 3.36 says, Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Or some translations have, it abides upon him. Friends, this is something that so few people consider today. God has a wholly settled opposition upon us on account of our sin outside of Christ. What a dreadful reality. But praise God, God is a God of peace and has made a way of reconciliation through Jesus Christ. You might ask, well, how has this been accomplished? Well, keep reading in verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. So God made peace through Jesus Christ, the great shepherd. As our great shepherd, Jesus saw us in our, in our great need. He saw us in our sin, in our desperate condition. And Jesus, praise God, didn't leave us to ourselves. He didn't ignore us. He didn't flee. But Jesus loved us enough that he laid down his life for us. And this gets at the heart as to why Jesus is a good shepherd. In John 10, 11, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus saw us in our desperate condition under our sin and the judgment of God. He didn't run, but he went willingly to the cross. And there he shed his blood as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. The wages of sin, God's word tells us, is death. And on the cross, Jesus endured the wages of sin by dying a death in our place. We see the signal by the next phrase in Hebrews 13:20. It says, by the blood of the eternal covenant. This is what Jesus set into place when he laid down his life on the cross. He was enacting or setting into place this eternal covenant enacted by his shed blood on the cross. It was a covenant between holy God and between sinful man that we, miracle upon miracles, can be in fellowship with God that we can be in relationship with God. It happens through this covenant. And this covenant is called an eternal covenant because the effects of Christ's sacrifice don't last for a year or two years or five years. It lasts for all eternity. Jesus put away sin once for all by a sacrifice on the cross. Now the phrase, the blood of the eternal covenant, it, it modifies the phrase, God brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. In other words, the reason why God brought again from the dead Jesus Christ was because of the blood of the eternal covenant. 
Does that sound strange to you? The reason why God raised Jesus from the dead was because Jesus died. He shed his blood with the eternal covenant. Does that make sense to you? you but it, there's a glorious truth here. Here's the truth. It's precisely because Christ laid down his sinless life and established the eternal covenant by a sacrificial death, and there he met all the holy demands of God's law. It's because of that that God raised Jesus from the dead. Let me illustrate this by focusing on the fact that it says here in verse 20 that the God of peace raised Jesus from the dead. It doesn't say Jesus raised himself from the dead or the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. It says the God of peace, God the Father, raised Jesus from the dead. And this is the way consistently in the New Testament it speaks of Christ's resurrection. God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. Why does it, why does it phrase it that way? Why is, this, why is it that God the Father raised Christ from the dead? The issue here is not one of power. It's not one of power. For we do read in John 10, 18 of Jesus having authority to lay down his life and to take it up again. So there are a few passages that do speak. Jesus speaks of that he lays down his life and he has the authority or power to take it up again. Jesus did rise again from the dead by his own power, showing he's the son of God. But why does it say here and in so many other passages of scripture, it's the God of peace, the father who raised Jesus from the dead. The issue is not one of power. The issue is one of divine justice. That's what's at stake here. When Christ laid down his life on the cross, he was enduring divine vengeance for our sin. He was suffering in our place what our sins deserved. And if Christ was guilty of any sin himself, then he would need to remain under the penalty of God's law. But Christ's sacrifice was indeed a perfect sacrifice. He met all of the demands of God's justice. And so God the Father was pleased and raised him from the dead. The resurrection is proof from God himself that the law's demands have been met by Jesus Christ. And Jesus has indeed paid the full penalty for our sin and therefore has accomplished peace between God and between us. How is God the God of peace? Because he's raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus paid the perfect payment for our sins. You can think of it this way. When you pay off a loan for your car or for your home, what do you receive from the bank? You receive a, 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 a piece of paper or some kind of statement that says, paid in full. All the demands of the law have been met. The resurrection is God's paid in full to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. We, we can have no doubt at all that Jesus indeed paid the full penalty for sins. Why? Because God raised Jesus from the dead. And if you are here today, and if you know that you are under the weight of sin, you know that you have not kept the demands of God's law, the call of the gospel is confess your sin and forsake your sin and believe in Jesus Christ. And here's the good news. And you will have peace with God. Where right now there's enmity between you and God because of Christ and by faith in him, you can be reconciled with God. Listen to God's word in Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Now look at verse 21. What's the prayer that's prayed to the God of peace? Verse 21 says, May he equip you with everything good that you may do his will. We, we are called as followers of Christ to do the will of God. The will of that is revealed to us in God's holy will. To walk in obedience to him, to walk in good works, to walk in a way that is honoring and pleasing to God. But in order for us to do God's will, we need to be equipped with everything good to do his will. The Greek word for equip means to put in proper condition. And it's used of a trainer who adjusts parts of the body. You think if you're preparing for some kind of um, some kind of activity, some kind of sports event, and, and you need help wrapping your ankle and getting that secure, and, and you, your back's tight, and so you need your, your back loosened up so you're ready to go, and, and uh, you, you need to care for the different parts of your body. 
so also every weakness in us, every shortcoming that we might have, every um, aspect of indwelling sin in our life, every, every shortcoming that we might have, that needs to be made right. So we are ready to walk in obedience to God. Matthew Henry says this, the good works that we ought to desire that other believers do include a perfection of integrity, a clear mind, a clean heart, lively affections, regular and resolved wills, and suitable strength for every good work to which they are called now. Or you might ask, well, how does God equip us to do his will? Look at verse 21. Working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. So if we're to walk in a way that's pleasing to God, then God needs to be at work within us. We cannot do this on our own. A work needs to be done in our heart first before it can be done in our lives. And this teaches us, beloved, that God is not after external conformity. He's not after just towing the line, but our hearts are far from him. If we would walk in a way that's truly pleasing to God, God must be working in us. We must become obedient from the heart, and then that works its way out of our lives in conformity to his will. A.W. Pink says, there must be conformity to the will of God in, or there cannot be conformity to the will of God in our life till there be conformity to him in the heart. Well, how can these good works be carried out? It says in verse 21, through Jesus Christ. In other words, our good works can only be accomplished through Christ. And our good works are only acceptable to God through Christ. The power and their satisfaction to God, it's all through Christ. It's all through our good shepherd. On our own, we can't accomplish these good works. Uh, Jesus says in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. But by the power of Christ working in us, by his promises, by his sacrifice on our behalf, by his indwelling Holy Spirit, by his intercession on our behalf, we are able to walk in obedience to the commands of God. And as we walk in obedience to God's will, we know that even our best works to God, they're always corrupted with sinful desires and sinful motives. And we're invariably looking at ourselves. The only way that our good works are pleasing to God is through the sacrifice of Christ. That he takes those imperfect works done in faith, and he covers over those imperfections. And then God looks upon them and he's pleased as we do his will. It's all through Christ, through our great shepherd. So friends, consider the good works that God has called you to do. Consider the ways in which God has called you to do his will in your life. In your family. In your marriage. In your job. In your use of money in your fight against sin, in what you think and what you say, in your courage to do something very difficult, in your walking in self-control. As you consider the high calling of doing God's will, you ought never to say, this is impossible. I cannot do this. It's too hard. I can't change. No, if you belong to Christ, he is your great shepherd, and through him God equips you with everything good to do his will. And therefore you can say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can be bold for Christ. I can put to death this addictive habit. I can press on and be faithful in a difficult marriage. I can love the unlovable. I can forgive those who have wronged me deeply. I can do all things without grumbling or complaining. Why? Because Jesus is my great shepherd. Look at the second demonstration of Christ's love. He gives his apostolic word to exhort you in your faith. Verse 22. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. The author here, he refers to his whole letter that he's written as a word of exhortation. And this word, uh, you might remember, was used in Acts 13, verse 15, when Paul spoke up in the synagogue and when he preached a sermon in Antioch in Pisidia. So that's what Hebrews is. This whole letter, it's not a theological treatise meant to just fill your mind with truths about Christ. 
It is a, it is a sermon in letter form meant to exhort you and spur you on in the faith. And this is a gift from our great shepherd. Hebrews is a gift from our great shepherd. Hebrews, like all of the books of the New Testament, are written with apostolic authority. All the books in the New Testament are written either by an apostle of Christ or a close associate of an apostle. And the apostles were those who were sent out by Christ as official ambassadors on his behalf to speak with his authority. And they ministered on behalf of Christ. And so the apostolic office, it was a gift from our Lord. Keep your finger here and turn back to uh, the book of Ephesians. I want you to see how the apostolic office was a gift from Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. It says this, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. What are some of these gifts? Look at verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So the apostles, amongst other gifts here, they're gifts by our Lord for the building up of the body of Christ. And we have the apostolic preserved for us today by the Spirit in the 27 books of the New Testament. All written so that we might grow in Christ's likeness. Brothers and sisters, what a gift the Word of God is. It's a gift from our good shepherd, Jesus Christ. How are we to receive it? Well, look at verse 22 in Hebrews 13. It says, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. This is a call, an appeal to the Hebrew Christians to receive this letter meekly and with patience. And the problem, it's not with the word. The word is inspired by the Spirit. That's not where the problem lies. The problem is with the weaknesses of the Hebrew Christians. Remember back in chapter 6, where the author there says that, um, that they were not ready for, for meat. They're only still living on milk. And he exhorts them that they, they should have been teachers by this time. So they, they don't have a desire to hear the deeper truths of Scripture, to be growing in their grace of Scripture. Their hunger for the Word of God was small. And the author here at the end of the passage, at the end of this letter, he says, bear with this. Pre press on through your weakness. Th that desire where, you know, you're, there's a disinterest, there's a lack of love for the word of God. Commit that to God. Ask God to increase that in your life where you desire the word of God. Th that ought to be our attitude to the word of God. Bear with it. The problem is not with the word of God. The problem is with our own desires within us. So easily we can be desiring other things in the Word of God, can't we? This last week, I, I heard from someone else that he's ministering at a church, and he said that uh, one of the other uh, congregants said that they wanted a sermon no longer than 15 minutes. Don't want it any longer than 15 minutes. That, that can be our desire. That's a reflection of a lack of a desire to bear with the Word of God. It's, it's, it's difficult. It's hard work to hear a sermon sometimes. You need to press on and say no to your, your desires. But... We say, this is God's word. This is how our great shepherd feeds us. We want to receive this. We know we need this. And so, God, may we bear with your word. When I was back in um, college and graduate school, uh, a professor of mine, he gave me an acronym that I want to commit to you. An acronym that I think is great to commit to memory. And anytime you are getting in God's word, at home, uh, with, with, your, with your spouse, family worship, at church, this is a great set of scriptures to be praying to God, that God would be um, tuning your heart to receive the word. And it's I-O-U-S. I-O-U-S. I is incline. Psalm 119, 36. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Help me not to be desiring things that are all oriented around myself, Lord. Incline my heart to you. O, open, open. Psalm 119, 18, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. 
I know there are glorious things in your word, God. Sometimes I don't see them. Help me to have eyes that are opened to behold wondrous things out of your law. You unite. Psalm 86, 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Help me, God, as I'm coming to your word to have a high view of you, that I would have a reverence towards you, that I would realize that this is the word of the living God. And then finally, S is satisfy. Psalm 90, verse 14. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. God, your word is a declaration uh, to me of your steadfast love. May I be satisfied in the promises that you give to me in Christ Jesus. Incline, open, unite, satisfy. Well, these next two points are much briefer. The third demonstration of our great shepherd is the love of God comes to you and flows to, uh, through you to all of his people. Look at verses 23 and 24. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Now, these two verses, they might seem innocuous. These might just seem like he's just closing up the letter. He's just sending greetings. What, what significance do we see here? But I submit to you, these are a picture of the love there ought to be in the body of Christ. Scripture tells us that if we know the love of our great shepherd, if the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart, then that love is going to be flowing to those in the body of Christ. We, we can't know the love of God truly without it flowing in the way that we relate to one another. 1 John 4, verse 7 says this, Beloved, let us love one another. For love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. If we know the love of God, it's going to manifest itself in the way that we relate to others in the body of Christ. Well, what does this love look like? First, it's personal. Look at verse 23. The author reports that Timothy, he's been released. And what are the author and Timothy planning on doing as soon as they're able to? It says, traveling together to visit the Hebrew Christians. They're wanting to go to the Hebrew Christians and to encourage them in their faith, to stir them up in their love for Christ. And we see an important principle here. Because our body matters, because our bodies matter, therefore personal ministry matters. And we see this throughout the New Testament. Let me read for you a couple passages. 2 John 12 says this, Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. And then 3 John uh, 13 and 14. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. And, and again, that's what we see in our passage, isn't it? He, he's written to them this letter extolling the greatness of Christ, and yet he doesn't view the letter as a replacement for personally ministering to them. And so in our digital age, we need to realize that our phones and our texts and social media, it can be a supplement for ministry, but it can never replace personal ministry. Technology can be a supplement to encouraging others in the faith, but it's not a replacement for spending time with other people. And that's because, friends, our bodies bear the image of God, and therefore spending time with people matters. This is demonstrated supremely by the fact that our Lord came to earth and became man like us and dwelt among us. And therefore, the way that we relate to one another, it matters. It matters that we spend time with one another. It, it matters that we talk to one another face to face. It matters that we greet one another personally with a handshake, with a hug. Face to face matters. And in this digital age, I think we need to hear this. Other things are not a replacement for personally spending time with one another. So our love for one another, it's personal. Secondly, it is affectionate. Look at verse 24. It says, he calls them to greet all their leaders and all the saints, and then he says, those from Italy send greetings. It's noteworthy that at the close of almost every New Testament letter, there is 
an extended section of greetings that are given from other believers. This happens again and again. Whether you greet fellow believers may not seem like a big deal to us, but it clearly is a big deal to God. Practical love shows up in how we welcome one another. And these greetings were affectionate. Five times in the New Testament, we are commanded, greet one another with a holy kiss. A holy kiss. It is a sin to be cold and standoffish with the people of God. We are called to be warm and affectionate with how we relate to one another. God's word tells us in Romans 12, verse 10, love one another with a brotherly affection. And the reason why God's called us to do this is because we're the family of God. We've been adopted into the family of God. God's our father and we're brothers and sisters. If you go to a household that um, they hadn't seen each other for some time and they all come together and there's no greeting, there's no um, kindness shown, uh, people hardly even say hi to one another, you'd say, this is not a healthy family. But if you go to a family and they're hugging each other and they're embracing one another and the smiles on their face and they're so happy to see one another, you'd say, this is a family that loves one another. How much more ought we to be the family of God where we have been born again by the spirit of the living God? We, we ought to have a warmth and affection towards one another. And if we're more introverted, where it's more of a struggle, that doesn't excuse us. It doesn't say greet one another if you're extroverted. But if you're introverted, I understand. This is an area where you might have to say, God, change my heart. Help me to not think of my own interests. Help me to think of the interests of others. To do what Christ did for me. The way that we reach out to others. Say, how are you doing? How is your week? Embrace them. Uh, give them a hug. Even give them a holy kiss. That, that matters. Our love ought to be affectionate. And finally, it's through our great shepherd that the grace of God is lavished upon us. Verse 25, a few short words, grace be with you all. Grace speaks of God's favor. And this is a prayer that God's favor would be with the Hebrew Christians. That God's favor would be with them to persevere them in the faith. That God's favor would equip them for every good work. That God's favor would keep them from falling away. That God's favor would be with them to help them grow in Christ's likeness. That God's favor would be with them to finish their race strong. We all need God's favor continually upon us. And this is what's meant in this closing prayer. And every single one of Paul's letters, it ends with this greeting, grace be with you. Every single one, all 13 of them. And most often, it's the longer phrase that's used. The longer phrase is this, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's used in Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and Philemon. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It's never the grace of God be with you or the grace of the Holy Spirit. It's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And that's certainly what's meant. It's implied in this statement here. The, may, may the grace, grace be with you all. It's speaking of the grace of Christ. So what does this mean? All grace comes to us from the Father because he is the fountain of all things. But it all comes to us through the conduit of his son, Jesus Christ. You can think of it in terms of the water that comes to your home. If you live in town here, all the water comes from the water supply here in town. But it all comes to us only through the main water valve. It's not going to be dumped upon us by a helicopter. It's not going to be brought in buckets to us. It all comes through the main water valve. All God's grace is from God the Father. It all comes to us through Jesus Christ. And so what this means is God's favor is upon us through Jesus through his sacrifice, through his ministry, through his intercession, through his gifts, through the working of the Spirit, all God's grace, all of his favor comes to you through your great shepherd. So, beloved, we are weak sheep. We are frail sheep. We have many weaknesses. We are so vulnerable. But rejoice that you have a great shepherd who loves you and who cares for you faithfully and personally and consistently. And all the ministry of Christ that we have learned about in Hebrews is all summed up in this title, He is our great shepherd. Have you considered that? In other words, Jesus is our great high priest. And what that means is, He's our great high priest 
as your great shepherd to minister to your need. He is a mediator of a better covenant. And he's a mediator of a better covenant to minister to your needs. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. And he is the author and perfecter to minister to your needs. So Jesus is not, beloved, this, this great and glorious second person of the Trinity, this mighty Savior, but he's distant from us. No, he is our great shepherd. His, his care for you is personal. His care for you is, is, is perfectly tailored to your needs. He knows all your needs and he is caring for you on your behalf. So what a, perso, a merciful, faithful, compassionate shepherd we have. And so we can all truly say with the psalmist, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let's pray. So, Father, we give you thanks for the book of Hebrews. We thank you, Father, for the great salvation that is in Christ Jesus. And we are thankful, Father, that all this is done in loving care for us. Father, I pray that we would rejoice and take heart in what a faithful shepherd we have in Christ Jesus. And, Father, I pray that, as we have read again and again in Hebrews, that we would always be looking to Jesus as we run this race, always looking to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Father, I pray that if there's any here today that they do not know you as the God of peace, that they are an enmity with you right now. Father, I pray that they would see the love of God in Christ Jesus, that they would, that they would arise and they go to Jesus and they would have confidence that Jesus will receive them, receive him or her safely in his arms. We thank you and we praise in Jesus' name. Amen.